so today, yeah, I'm going to talk about some insect odent receptor work we're doing. And I will say that this is quite a new topic for me and also I think for structural work in general. So um, there's definitely a lot we still, I won't be able to answer. And uh, I'm really open to have feedback and suggestions on this work. And I think already a lot of the talks today have been really helpful. Um, so just who I am, I'm Cassie. Uh, I'm a postdoc who just started at uh, Lund University and the new Max Planck Center for Next Generation Insect Chemical Ecology, which is an absolute mouthful of a name. Um, and yeah, I'll just give you a little introduction as to why we're interested in this work and then move on to what I've been doing so far. Oops. So insect olfaction, like why do we care? A lot of people today have talked about uh, sort of um, medicinal targets and things like that. And I think that stuff like what we work on tends to get a little overlooked. Um, and insect olfaction is really important. Um, as I said in the abstract, I'm going to talk about moths and mosquitoes. Uh, for two, they're important for two different reasons. Moths are pests usually of agriculture and we're really interested in controlling them. And mosquitoes are of course pests of humans. So we're interested in them from a um, medicinal kind of human health standpoint. And olfaction is really important as a sense for insects. And in fact, it's basically the major sense that is used in, in most insects. And already we can use chemical ecology approaches to manage and control insect populations. As a kind of colloquial example, I'm sure many people spray DEET onto themselves to avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes. Um, but there are lots of uh, field applications for this work already. And we hope to, to understand insect olfaction to develop better methods in this area and to kind of exploit um, the chemical ecology of these insects against them. So a little introduction to the system and the, the proteins we're going to talk about today. Um, in the peripheral insect olfactory system, which happens in the antenna, so I'm not thinking about what's going on in like the brain or anything. Um, we have two main groups of proteins, these odent binding proteins, which are not membrane bound proteins, so not of interest to us today. But what is interesting is the odent receptors. And these are heteromeric complexes. So they form a complex with something called the uh, odent receptor co-receptor or ORCO. And orco is highly conserved across all insects, but you actually only have like one orco per species, whereas you have then a range of odent receptors which have different specificities for different ligands. So it's a really interesting system. Um, it forms a, a tetramer, so with the orco and OR subunits, and each subunit is a seven transmembrane domain protein. I think initially they were thought to have a really similar structure to GPCRs, but they actually have an inverted topology to what GPCRs do. So um, they're kind of unique and there is of course limited structural data for these types of proteins. So there's a huge amount of functional studies that show that these receptors vary so much in their function, in their specificity, for example. So you have some receptors which only respond to one ligand and, and that's they're highly specific. And you have some which are more broadly tuned to a range of ligands. So there really must be some differences between them, but we don't really understand these. Um, in terms of structural work so far, I can't claim to say that I've had any part in any of it, but I will give you a rundown of what they're is. The first structure was published uh, two, three years ago now, 2018, by Vanessa Ruta's lab group, who are a lab group from uh, America, and they published this cryo-EM derived structure, which was produced in HEC 293 cells. So the HEC cells are used quite commonly for functional assays of these proteins. Um, I can say a little bit about why we choose not to use these for our work in a minute. But um, this was published as a structure of ORCO. So this is just the co-receptor in a homomeric complex. Uh, very recently, the same lab group has gone on to just publish. This is a preprint, so it's not uh, fully published yet. But uh, you can go check it out if you're interested um, of a odent receptor. But this is, again, in a homomeric complex. So they chose this odent receptor from an ancient insect, which I think, and don't quote me on this, maybe predates the evolution of the co-receptor of ORCO. So, they have this homomeric complex of an odor receptor which has a binding pocket and their intention was to look at the binding pocket and how this opens what is an ion channel that uh, obviously causes a neurological kind of response. 
So they identified a binding pocket and some of the functionality of this protein. And it's, this is a huge step in the right direction for our work. But unfortunately, OR5 is not a specifically tuned receptor. They found that it was quite broadly tuned and they didn't find that much specificity in the pocket. So we still have a lot of unanswered questions <laughs> and they still also haven't done an odent receptor odent receptor co-receptor complex, which is how it is in insects themselves. So we really are interested in seeing how this functions, because I think it's not quite the same if you have four binding pockets and you're showing a mechanism of opening versus one binding pocket that should activate the opening. So there's still a lot of uh, work to be done. So our aim was to try and do some structural work with these proteins, but in yeast. Um, why yeast? Well, a lot of people have talked today about why it's a great system for membrane uh, structure, kind of determinate membrane protein structure determination. Um, we also, people have mentioned hex cells, and I think hex cells are really a valid way of doing this for cryo EM. One of the reasons we were interested in not doing uh, hex cells was one, we wanted to create a high throughput system that produces a lot of protein, and because we might do crystallography as well, we don't know yet. Um, and also because there is actually uh, some inconsistency sometimes with the hex cells in terms of uh, the functional studies that we do, and you can get some kind of weird results. They're not consistent with other functional assays. So although we don't really know about the functionality in yeast, we at least have a fresh start to, to see how it goes. So I kind of just put on here like a, an overview of what our process was going to be. But of course, this is a lot of work condensed into a very simple diagram. Um, Right now, I'm at this point. So I only started this project <laughs> this year, really. So we're at the point where we've transformed some yeast and we're seeing what happens. So in terms of the choice of receptors, there are so many to choose from. And there are, this is a list here of the ones we went with. Um, we tended to choose highly specific receptors apart from one on there, which has an unusual functionality, which um, I won't talk about too much today, but it has some two, two ligands that it responds to. And we also have collaborators in Swedish Agricultural University who are interested in mosquito receptors. So I can't really tell you detail of why they chose these ones, because in this case, I'm following instruction rather than uh, coming up with the idea myself. Um, but we decided to go for about 12, just because this seemed like a reasonable number to start with. But really, this the reasons why these are on this list, there are so many I could have picked. And at some point, I just had to pick. 12 basically so um you know don't, don't read too much into this um we initially did the cloning um a few people have talked about some of the design elements to this today and uh, we did a multiple site gateway cloning to produce a plasmid which has a zeosin resistance marker um has our odent receptor co-receptor gene and has an efp fusion odent receptor gene um the reason being that we thought that with the odent receptor, it tends to be seen that you don't get functional expression of this without the ORCO in place. The ORCO has some, fun, you know, has a role to play in expressing that. So we figured that if we saw GFP that the OR would be expressing and, and therefore the ORCO as well. Um, obviously that's an assumption and we will have to check later on that, that that's the way it works. They also have consti constitutive um, promoters and we didn't you know, intend to direct them anywhere to express in the yeast because we just wanted to see if we could express them in yeast at all, really, to begin with. Um, it was a bit of, it's it's one of those projects where you go in and you have no expectations that anything will work, but you've just got to see what happens. So we generated the this these plasmids in E. In e. coli and then did the linearization to transform them into yeast um, and selected our transformants with zeosim. Um, after that, I've done some additional selection with high zeosin concentrations and also checking uh, fluorescence because it being constitutive, we can see expression uh, in just the colonies uh, that we initially get. And of course, there will be a lot more optimization steps <laughs> that will come after this. Um, and so far, we have four of our orco complexes that I believe are successfully cloned, um, and I've got many more to keep trying. Um, how am I checking that it worked? Uh, PCR, sequencing, <laughs> fluorescence, um, kind of all the standard things, but just to let you know that this is what we're doing. So right now I am continuing with checking these and transforming and performing optimization. But I wanted to share, we did some initial confocal microscopy 
pictures um, of one of the initial transformed colonies, so after no optimization. Um, and I think we see that there is GFP expressing, but as you can see, I think it's not in that many of the yeast cells. So this is certainly something we want to uh, try and optimize. And this might involve things like fact sorting or um, you know, optimizing based on the fluorescence. But I think it looks like the GFP is expressing, which was a huge, hugely positive sign for, <laughs> for me. Um, and just the kind of close up, I guess, of that, that one. I, I'm no expert on these kinds of things. And certainly this was not an optimized confocal kind of experiment. We, we really just, the, the confocal guide not really even worked with yeast that much. So we were just seeing if we could get, get any pictures really. Um, but I think it does look as if it is expressing uh, towards the membrane, which I think is uh, again, a positive sign because we didn't really target anything or really know um, what's gonna happen. So it's kind of a lot of, um, preliminary work so far but I have a lot a lot of time and a lot of things to do going forward so of course I need to optimize the growth of these strains that we've generated um, by monitoring for example biomass or the fluorescence I mean there are two approaches how can I grow the most and how can I grow the most that's expressing the most um, hoping to sort the cell lines using facts so that we can get rid of those yeast that aren't expressing and of course, there's the protein purification and detergent screening steps. And the big question as well for me is that we need to determine that this is a functional protein and uh, this will certainly be something that's gonna need a lot of thought and uh, assay design <laughs> to, to figure out a way of doing this. Um, just say thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions or you can always email me afterwards if uh, you can't think of something now. Um, just to say thank you to my supervisors, Krista and Matt, to Bao Zhang, who I think is here, and uh, he helped so much with the cloning and, and helped design everything and, and show me how to do everything. Topi and Johanna, who showed me how to work with yeast. Um, I don't think even mentioned that we're using Pikia yeast with uh, X33 strain, if anyone is interested. And of course, Ola, who is the microscope person, because I can't say the word, um, who helped you with the confocal to begin with, and I think will help me going forward to generate some better confocal images. So that's me. Thank you very much. Um... I was a bit curious. You you are co-expressing the receptor with the uh, this uh, orco yeah. co-receptor. What do you call it? Um, do you have you considered like putting? You only have the GFP tag on the receptor. Yeah. Have you considered like putting a visual tag on orco just so you can see that you have both? Yeah, we did think about this, but we wanted to reduce um, the amount of kind of tagging we did just because if this turned out to work we hope that that would help us then you know yeah. be less messy further down the line and save us some work mm -hmm. um and i think it's uh it's like there is a chance that the, the orco will express on its own without the or but there is very little chance that the or will express without the orco so i think the idea of putting it on the or was that if we see this gfp expression we have both expressing because mm -hmm. uh, this is more likely um but like i said that's that's based on work in other systems so i don't know that that will be the case and certainly that's something we have to look at yeah so speaking about other system would we have a question from Ariane about you if you considered insect cells yep yeah and we did basically this was the decision between yeast and insect cells um because i think that insect cells are a valuable uh option for this. Um, it just came down to the fact that we had expertise in the yeast stuff on hand and that we felt that we could do maybe higher throughput uh, assays this way. Um, but the idea is like, if this doesn't work, we go to insect cells next, you know, so it's definitely a consideration. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a question about uh, from Martin Caffrey, if uh, humans also have ORCO. Um, humans do not have ORCO, so human odorant receptors are actually are GPCRs, I believe. Um, they're completely different in mammals from insects. We don't have, we don't do odorant detection in the same way as insects, and yeah, we don't have ORCO. It's uh, insect-specific 